Today we will be dealing about malignant tumors of uh, skin. In the previous lecture we have seen about various benign soft tissue tumors of the skin. Today we will go ahead with uh, the malignant tumors involving skin. Okay. Among the malignant tumors involving skin, the first tumor that comes into mind is basal cell carcinoma. Basal cell carcinoma is one of the uh, you know invasive cancer of the basal cell of the epidermal layer and uh, it is also called as rodent ulcer because it eats away all the tissue that comes in contact with it. However, one good thing about this basal cell carcinoma is it is of a low grade malignancy and it is a slow growing tumor. It almost takes about years you know to complete completely involve a particular part of the skin. This basal cell carcinoma usually we can also see multiple solitary basal cell carcinoma and multiple basal cell carcinomas and we can see this multiple basal cell carcinomas especially in people who are exposed to arsenic you know arsenic usage this arsenic is usually present in the skin ointments etc if if the patient is exposed to this kind of arsenic usage for a long period of time then we can also see this basal cell carcinomas and uh, this basal cell carcinoma is known to occur in areas where people are exposed to bright sunlight. Hence, we can see more predominance of this especially in Australia because of the high actinic value of the sunlight that is high brightness component and high you know, UV, uh, UV radiation component within it. So, we can see uh, this kind of uh, basal cell carcinomas in areas where there is more amount of actinic uh, value in the sunlight. Okay. And then this, uh, as I said, they have these are you know uh, of two types again, solitary and multiple. However, we have another type of classification which is a microscopic classification, and the variants of this basal cell carcinoma based upon the histology. We have ulcerative type, we have nodular type, we have cystic type, pigmented type, file fire or forest type or geographic type. Among all these, ulcerative type of uh, basal cell carcinoma is usually more predominantly seen. However, we have something called as nodular variety. Nodular variety is nothing but your ba the basal cell car the carcinomatous growth is slightly averted or it is raised above the surface of the skin layer and it appears as a nodular one. And further what happens, this nodular uh, uh, basal cell carcinoma in, uh, in, in some period of time get erodes and a central ulcer is formed. This central ulcer in due course of time gets necrotized or by cystic changes can appear and hence it appears as a cystic uh, inconsistency. But remember it is not a true cyst. I mean it is not a true cyst and hence it is uh, uh, called as cystic rodent ulcer because of the cystic changes that are appearing in the center. So a nodular variety can turn into a cystic variety of uh, basal cell carcinoma. We have other one called as pigmented type of basal cell carcinoma because of more amount of melanin production within it and we have another type called as file fire or forest fire. Why file fire? Because its appearance is like that. We have a central uh, heal, healing ulcer but not so, I mean it is not a very good healing ulcer uh, with pale granulation tissue it is present and we have a nice advancing edge surrounding this central ulcer. Okay, This is called as file fire or forest type also called as geographic type of basal cell carcinoma. So we have these are the various microscopic types or various histopathological histological types of our basal cell carcinoma. What is this, uh, the what is the pathognomic appearance of this, uh, you know, uh, basal cell carcinoma histopathologically is we have palisade arrangement of the epidermis. The cells are arranged in a palisading pattern and usually we do not see any kind of keratinization or cell rest and no prickle cells or mitotic figures. As in squamous cell carcinoma we see predominantly prickle cells whereas in basal cell carcinoma we see less number of prickle cells and also less number of mitotic figures. We have some one other tumor uh, of variant of basal cell carcinoma called as turban tumor or epithelium adenoides cysticum. Okay, this is nothing but in your turban tumor what happens? They arise from the basal cells of the hair follicles and glands. This turban tumor arises from your the basal cells of the scalp uh, cells, hair follicles and the skull. As I already told, uh, basal cell carcinoma is a can, is a carcinoma which is appearing, it is occurring at the basal layer, right? At the basal layer of the epidermis. So the similar basal cells of the skull and hair follicles are affected and hence the name turban tumor, okay? It is uh, also called as turban tumor. And uh, we have lymph nodes usually not very much involved in our uh, basal cell carcinoma. 
and one other important thing is I, I actually told you it is most common on the skin uh, that is exposed to sunlight right so the middle third of the face and also the forehead forehead especially in women is more commonly infected or affected in our basal cell carcinoma it is also called as tear cancer tear cancer because as the tears roll down right we have these tears roll down like this and sometimes like this so this along this line we see more number of basal cell carcinomas so it is also called as tear cancer and the spread of this is it is usually by local invasion 90 percent spread of basal cell carcinoma is by local invasion it slowly that's the name why it is rodent also because it eats away all the skin that is coming adjacent to it uh, it is for good it is actually a slow growing uh, tumor okay and lymphatic spread and hematogenous spread are very rare probably 10 percent of cases we can see this kind of uh, lymphatic or hematogenous spread and coming to the clinical features of our basal cell carcinoma uh, as nodular or ulcerative type it appears like a small nodule and uh, and ulcers also we can see within the center as this nodule erodes usually a non-painful nodular growth itchy surface can be present a uh, persistent ulcer or nodule is will be present in case of this basal cell carcinoma. If untreated, this nodule or ulcer gets big and it goes deep enough and it can sometimes you know expose the underlying connective tissue also. Slow growing but uh, it will have slight amount of bleeding unlike our uh, uh, square cell carcinomas where more amount of bleeding can be seen when compared to basal cell carcinomas. Multiplicity, you can see multiple number of uh, uh, basal cell carcinomas usually than solitary variety we have multiple variety mul uh, multiple uh, you know basal cell carcinoma variants and uh, clinical features other clinical features include the uh, floor it is usually covered with the dry serum and also some amount of epithelial cells so these are the various clinical features of uh, basal cell carcinoma and uh, uh, usually the nodule no fluctuance though it is cystic in with, with, we, we actually saw a cystic variant of uh, basal cell carcinoma, right? But that cystic variant, as I told, is not a true cyst. Hence, no fluctuance is observed, no fluid will be present and enlargement of lymph nodes also is very, very rare. Now, coming to radio, uh, the management, how do we actually manage this basal cell carcinomas? First thing is radiotherapy. 90% of uh, uh, all basal cell carcinomas respond very well to radiotherapy. Okay. However, there are some contraindications, especially when it is occurring in the outer canthus of eye or very close to your, uh, uh, you know, eyelid region or at the back of your uh, hand or if it is present in vicinity to bone or cartilage, radiotherapy is usually contraindicated. Okay. It is a relative contraindication and surgery, if it is... Uh, when your radiotherapy is contraindicated, then we go ahead with surgery. Even in surgery also, we have high recurrence rate when compared to your uh, 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 radiotherapy. And we can get this new lesions can be formed in case of this surgery. And uh, then newer mode of uh, surgical therapy is cryosurgery. Where, uh, you know, in cryosurgery, we use dry ice, you know, carbon uh, dioxide, dry carbon dioxide will be used. And uh, cryosurgery also sh uh, has shown more amount of recurrences. However, it is again one good method in preventing excessive scars unlike your uh, surgical uh, uh, techniques, okay? Local chemotherapy, usually a palliative one uh, or bleomycin injections can be given. 5-fluorouracil uh, can also be given as local chemotherapy as a topical cream, okay? However, uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, efficacy is not very good when compared to your radiotherapy. Recent uh, advancements, laser therapy is also one good, uh, you know, uh, laser therapy is also uh, one of the good management techniques that has been recently encountered, especially when, when we're talking about solitary basal cell carcinomas, which is not truly, I mean, not very deeply invaded, we can go ahead with laser therapy. Now, the next one is squamous cell carcinomas. Squamous cell carcinomas is actually one of the, uh, you know, very commonly encountered unlike our basal cell carcinomas. Basal cell carcinomas are also seen, but it is usually geographically uh, predominated one in case of this uh, basal cell carcinomas. However, squamous cell carcinomas are usually uh, most, effect, most uh, you know, related to lifestyle changes, habits, 
especially tobacco, alcohol, etc. So when we are talking about this squamous cell carcinoma, it is also called as epidermoid carcinoma or epithelioma. Okay, squamous cell carcinoma is also called as epidermoid carcinoma or epithelioma. It usually starts with the within the prickle cell layer of the epidermis, and then it migrates uh, towards the epidermis. In invasive cases, what happens? This uh, from the prickle cell layer, it actually goes deep, invades the underlying connective tissue. Uh, I forgot to tell you about the edges of basal cell carcinoma. Edges of basal cell carcinoma are usually uh, averted edges. We can see pearly bearded appearance will be seen in case of your basal cell carcinoma. Whereas in squamous cell carcinoma, we'll have rolled out edges. Okay, you have a rolled out edge in case of your squamous cell carcinoma. Next, coming to coming back to our squamous cell carcinoma again. Uh, coming to occurrence of it, most of the squamous cell carcinomas uh, sometimes they occur de novo. De novo is like you know. Uh, like a fresh lesion, lesion. sometimes they can ex they can develop from some pre-existing lesion. Those lesions are nothing but pre-malignant conditions or pre-malignant lesions. Now the new term is potentially malignant disorders. Okay, these potentially malignant disorders can be oral submucous fibrosis, leukoplakia. It can be Marjolin's ulcer, which is a long-standing ulcer. It can be a venous ulcer, which has been a long-standing ulcer. So in these cases, we can see squamous cell carcinoma developing from a pre-existing lesion. We can also see some of the squamous cell carcinomas developing from your basal cell carcinomas. And these are specifically called as basosquamous uh, carcinomas. Okay, so these are various, these are, these are how they actually occur. And coming to the sites of uh, occurrence, where they occur any area where there is squamous epithelium. Okay, at any base of squamous epithelial junction, we can see squamous, this uh, carcinomas. And usually, skin is the most common site. We can see from the uh, you know junction of skin and mucous membrane, or directly mucous membrane, especially the buccal mucosa of oral cavity, tongue. We can see. We can see. Uh, uh, even we can see this intra. Alveolar carcinomas also, okay, squamous cell carcinomas of intraalveolar, and we can see from the tongue, and also transitional epithelium, especially that that one that is present in ureters or urinary bladder. We can see even in transitional epithelium also, we can see uh, development of squamous cell carcinoma. Coming to risk factors or predisposing factors for squamous cell carcinoma, as I already told, lifestyle plays a very very important role in development or in being a carcinogenic effect in case of a squamous cell carcinoma. The first and foremost is habit. Habit especially tobacco chewing habit. Either chewable or smoking. Smoking uh, you know tobacco. This type of tobacco. Cigarette smoking. Chewable tobacco includes your uh, tobacco diet. Tobacco chewing. Gutka. Pan. Uh, mystery etc. All this can lead to uh, change in the uh, dysplastic changes in the epithelium which can convert again into your squamous cell carcinoma okay and then uh, other predisposing factors as i already told any pre-malignant conditions especially leukoplakia burn or scar osteomyelitic sinus also can develop into squamous cell carcinoma remember and other other thing is any habit which has been existing or present through their tradition. For example, in Kashmiris, what they do is they have a particular type of stomach cancer called as Kangri cancer. This is because to you know combat the cold environment there, what they do is they uh, heat the uh, pots and they actually hold it near the stomach to fight the cold. I mean to save themselves from the cold outside because of the chronic thermal irritation that is caused because of this hot oven pots what happens they develop carcinomas of stomach most commonly and this is called as candy cancer similar type even in japan uh, areas or tibetians especially then the tibetians what they do they keep it near the thighs and we can see kangri cancer of the thighs also so this is based upon the habit that has been constantly present uh, in the in the tradition in case of squamous cell carcinoma and we have carcinomas based upon occupation also even occupation also sometimes you know uh, uh, can lead to some kind of cancer for example in chimney sweepers we can see cancers of your thigh even in the chimney sweepers so these are uh, uh, various types of or risk factors that are present for squamous cell carcinoma and uh, you know actinic uh, senile keratosis bovine's disease lupus vulgaris uh, even syphilitic syphilitic uh, uh, glossitis loose mal maligna okay one type of uh, uh, in, because of infections 
uh, yeah, syphilitic infection of the tongue what happened the long standing it can turn into malignancy so these are various types some kind of infections that are also causing this squamous cell carcinomas now coming to different types of the squamous cell carcinoma we have broadly two different types one is proliferative type and one is ulcerative type we have third variant where the proliferation which has been outgrown can become into ulcerate ulcer that is called as ulceroproliferative lesion so when we are actually describing a case of squamous cell carcinoma we actually describe if there is an ulcer along with proliferation we describe it as an ulceroproliferative lesion okay so these are two variants in the first picture you can see a proliferative variant where they are, it has grow, grown in size bigger than the uh, the opposite side and in the second picture we can see an ulceration it is actually an ulceroproliferative growth there is a proliferation there which further became an ulcer okay now coming to spread of this Uh, squamous cell carcinoma squamous cell carcinoma most predominant spread is through lymphatic route right? but it can also spread through hematogenous local invasion is also one of the most common type of spread okay in the lymphatic spread what happens is because of the invasion of this cancer cells uh, of the adjacent uh, you know mm, draining lymph nodes it can actually Uh, uh lead to metastasis okay where the uh, lymph nodes are infiltrated because with this tumor cells leading to lymph node metastasis there is something called as skip metastasis skip metastasis is nothing but sometimes what happens is if there is carcinoma of your mandible okay instead of involving your submandibular it can directly involve your level 2 lymph nodes leaving off the submandibular lymph node there so this is nothing but skip metastasis where the first lymph node that has to be involved is no, is skipped and the next level of lymph nodes or further next level of lymph nodes can be involved that is the reason whenever we are checking or when we are suspecting a carcinoma always check for all levels of lymph node do not just check for the draining lymph nodes okay check for all the levels of lymph node so that that will help us in uh, skipping the diagnosis there okay which level of lymph node is affected we have another concept in case of this squamous cell carcinoma which is called as field cancerization especially in the oral cavity this field cancerization is it is nothing but uh, and we don't you know uh, if for example patient has a uh, buccal uh, carcinoma uh, i mean Uh, squamous cell carcinoma of buccal mucosa he might also have squamous cell carcinoma of, of tongue because this common this area has been exposed to a common environmental factor okay for example patient is chewing tobacco tobacco need not be present only at one localized location right whenever he is chewing the tobacco the juice of tobacco will be present at the buccal mucosa will come in contact with the buccal mucosa also will come in contact with other uh, areas of your mouth okay hence apart from this this tobacco may induce dysplastic changes even in other places also so whenever there is a cancer of oral mucosa at one place also check for other primaries that are present in uh, you know other areas this is called as a concept of field cancerization okay now uh, when we are actually talking about the various clinical features how this you know uh, squamous cell carcinoma usually appear this squamous cell carcinoma first clinical sign is patient usually come first patient will have growth and then it come it it de it develops into pain so and unlike inflammatory swellings where pain is present first later swelling is present in ma in case of benign or malignant tumors there will be swelling first uh, which is uh, you know uh, followed by pain when it is secondarily infected or when it is invading or when it is causing pressure on the adjacent structures okay usually a uh, squamous cell carcinoma is seen in patients more than 40 years of age males are predominant more commonly affected than females probably because of you know more uh, um, affinity towards this habit and seen in chimney sweepers in uh, you know oil patients who are, i mean in people who are working with oils in uh, engineers especially who are working more amount on oils patient uh, you know people who are working in excessive sunlight area <coughs> excuse me in a uh, more amount of sunlight we can see uh, this kind of uh, squamous cell carcinoma as a predisposing factor this uh, lesion usually can be a proliferative lesion initially which may form further get in ulcerated and when we are actually uh, site as we have discussed it can be any place in the wherever we have we see this squamous cell 
especially uh, skin here you know, we can see it on the oral mucosa on the tongue on alveolar bone etc and in the scrotal skin also in if the swelling is present then we actually inspect usually uh, it is uh, a nodular or a proliferative or an ulcerative lesion and the surroundings will be uh, uh, advancing edges can be seen in the surrounding when we palpate it usually the surrounding are markedly indurated the base and the margins are markedly indurated in case of squamous cell carcinoma the edges are usually rolled out okay we have a rolled out edges in case of squamous cell carcinomas uh, when we check for lymph nodes lymph nodes are usually stony hard lymph nodes will most of the times are involved in case of squamous cell carcinoma they on palpation they are usually enlarged they are usually non tender uh, unless secondarily infected and uh, we see they are usually fixed to underlying structures and when it comes to consistency they are usually hard especially stony hard in case of your advanced squamous cell carcinomas so these are about various clinical features that appears uh, and local examination also uh, the similar to our clinical features coming to management of this squamous cell carcinomas usually in the squamous cell carcinoma first primary mode of treatment is surgery in the surgery also if it is involving the uh, uh, lesion only just this area excision of a lesion with 2 cm uh, margin has to be excised to reduce the recurrence or to prevent the recurrence if it is occurring on the finger or toe better do an amputation of the finger or toe if this uh, uh, in case of uh, squamous cell carcinoma is involving the adjacent lymph nodes perform radical neck dissection in case of your head and neck tumors coming to radiotherapy radiotherapy is uh, indicated whenever we cannot perform a surgery okay whenever it is inaccessible to surgery or if the lesion is very big uh, which may leave a very big defect then radiotherapy is advised radiotherapy usually helps in shrinking the tumor initially further we can do a surgery or second thing was whenever we do a surgery if a surgeon suspects there could be some remnants of the you know cancer cells or if he suspects a field cancerization then we can go for radiotherapy to to you know kill those extra uh, uh, you know cells that are present there with radiotherapy if you are giving radiotherapy to head and neck region usually it is 55 grays given and it is given in about uh, 5 uh, 2 grays dose in 5 cycles for 5 days a week ok in 5 days a week 2 grays will be given for 5 cycles in that is in 5 successive uh, weeks total 55 grays of uh, radiation will be, de will be delivered uh, in case of head and neck uh, or uh, cancers ok and then uh, uh, as we have seen lymph nodes involvement if it is not involved, involved we can leave it if secondarily involved we have to perform a biopsy fine needle aspiration biopsy can be helpful otherwise we have to do a radical neck dissection in case of this uh, lymph node involvement of squamous cell carcinoma the next type of uh, malignant uh, tumor is again glandular carcinoma in this glandular carcinoma is nothing but you know a malignant tumor that is arising from uh, secreting cells okay from tumor from the secreting epithelium or underlying glands this secreting epithelium or and the underlying uh, glands you know glandular epithelium what happens there will be a tumorous growth tumefaction which will under which will uh, start in the basement layer membrane and from this basement membrane it actually goes into uh, the underlying structures they actually these cells they are arranged in a SNR structure with this SNR structure what happens in the center there will be a lumen and these secreting cells which are present you know in this pattern will secrete will pour these secretions within this lumen okay this is nothing but a glandular carcinoma based on the arrangement of these cells the SNR cells it is again divided into your columnar cuboidal polygonal or spheroidal type of types of uh, uh, glandular carcinomas here these glandular carcinomas are usually most commonly seen in GI tract like seen in breast in kidney in gallbladder prostate and also in the thyroid so these are various uh, areas where we can see our glandular carcinomas based upon again uh, differentiation of uh, you know and arrangement of these tumor cells we have seen arrangement of SNR epithelium into uh, different types like like spheroidal cuboidal type we have seen it as columnar type etc based on the differentiation of these uh, uh, cells it is again divided into four major types one is adenocarcinoma carcinoma simplex we have most undifferentiated carcinoma and mucoid uh, or colloid carcinoma where we can see a characteristic signet ring cell 
In adenocarcinoma, what happens is, this adenocarcinoma is a best differentiated cancer in glandular carcinomas. We have excellent uh, SNS for, uh, formation here in case of this adenocarcinoma. Carcinoma simplex is again a variant where we can, uh, uh, you know, usually a less differentiated one. Usually it has clumps of cells which are surrounded by your stroma. In carcinoma simplex, what happens? We have uh, cells which are surrounded by stroma there and no much central cavitation seen. In carcinoma simplex, what happens? I told you right, there will be a lumen in the center. Here in carcinoma simplex, usually we cannot see central cavit uh, cavitation. And the structure also, it is not usually a glandular structure. We cannot, we, we cannot appreciate much of glandular structure in case of carcinoma simplex. The next one is most undifferentiated carcinoma, glandular carcinoma. The name itself indicates it is highly, it has highly undifferentiated cells. That is the reason what happens is, it is difficult for us to uh, you know, uh, differentiate between your glandular carcinoma and, I mean, glandular carcinoma, this variant, the most undifferentiated cancer uh, carcinoma variant of glandular from squamous cell carcinoma. This is because the cells are very much diffuse and it has a typical of anaplastic conditions, okay? Most undifferentiated carcinoma has typical anaplastic features. Next is mucoid or colloid carcinoma. It is again similar to your carcinoma simplex. Here what happens is the cells, uh, they have, they are actually filled with so much of mucus. This, as there is so much of mucus, what happens, the nucleus which has to be in the center is pushed away to one edge, you know, towards the base, towards the uh, cell membrane or to the cell wall. So this appears like a central pale mucus with the nucleus at one end resembling a signet ring, okay, resembling a ring. So it is, it, these cells are called as signet ring cells and they are pathognomic feature of our mucoid or colloid carcinoma. Here we can see the uh, swelling here is again soft gelatinous material because of more amount of mucus mean it has that mucus mass within it so it is so soft and gelatinous usually we have uh, because it in the center we have this more amount of mucus structure surrounding we can see surrounding the tumor we can have this fibrous uh, stromal or fibrous tissue reaction can be seen this mucoid uh, you know colloid carcinoma because it, it has nothing in it right more amount of pouring of mucus so it nicely spreads it has it spreads very easily and to very fast also when compared to other three most commonly we can see in bowel in stomach and also in lung okay mucoid or colloid carcinomas are usually seen in stomach in the lungs and also in the bowel okay so this is about based upon the differentiation of the cells how uh, glandular carcinoma is divided Next, based upon the stromal reaction, I told you, right, in the center there is a uh, uh, pouring of your cell, uh, mucus material there. So, because by, by pouring of uh, mucus material there, what happens? Surroundingly, it is usually, uh, th there will be a reaction, especially the stromal reaction which is present around it. So, this stromal reaction, based upon the stromal reaction, it is again divided into three types. One is serous carcinoma, atropic serous carcinoma and encephaloid or medullary carcinoma, okay? So, uh, this, based on these three uh, stromal reactions, they are divided into three types. Among them, the serous uh, carcinoma, most commonly seen in the breast and stomach. By the name itself, serous, it is more amount of fibrotic tissue under it, right? So, it is very hard tumor, usually formed as very hard tumor and... Uh, if it occurs in the breast, as I said, most common uh, location is breast. Whenever we see this serous carcinoma in the breast, what happens is like we can see dimpling of skin and also retraction of the nipple. These are characteristic features of serous carcinoma of breast. If uh, It can also occur in the colon where we have a annular variety uh, if it occurs in the colon. Usually the serous carcinoma is usually of very poor prognostic value. And next one is atrophic serous carcinoma. In this atrophic serous carcinoma, we have more amount of fibrous element when compared to your serous carcinoma. It is even more harder. It is very hard tumor when compared to serous one. And the third type variant is encephaloid or medullary carcinoma. Here what happens is there will be very little stromal, uh, stroma to the cell bulk. Okay, For the cell reaction, we have very little stroma. And uh, it is usually uh, not very cirrhotic. It is not very fibrotic. And hence the uh, tumor is usually soft when you compare to the other two variants. Next we have uh, marzolin ulcer. Marzolin ulcer, actually it is an ulcer on a or is uh, uh, present or a scar that is present on a long term burn or a, uh, burn is present you know. So 
on a widespread burn this kind of ulcer can develop squamous cell carcinoma can arise from this kind of an ulcer or scar where there was a long or uh, no widespread burn was present okay this margolins also are usually very slow growing and but they have, they have more potential for malignancy usually we don't see any kind of lymph node metastasis however uh, even we can also see the squamous cell carcinoma arising from venous ulcer also a chronic venous ulcer and the edges are may not be always be raised uh, unlike a squamous cell carcinoma it is usually less invasive and we come to management of it wide excision has to be done at least with one centimeter of margin to prevent recurrence there and if a limb is involved or a foot is involved or any fingers are involved usually amputation especially for the foot okay we do amputation to prevent recurrence again uh, this margarine ulcer is absolutely radio resistant and hence do not even think about radiotherapy in these cases next is melanomas malignant melanomas are one of the dreadful fast spreading kind of uh, you know cancers of the skin and they account for about 9 to uh, about 9 to 15% of all skin malignancies melanomas are you know uh, one of the most potentially fatal uh, malignant tumors these malignant melanomas usually are malignant lesion of your melanoblast okay melanoblast uh, uh, usually they arise you know these melanoblast and we have melanocytes melanoblast are the immature melano melanin producing cells which actually turn into melanocytes these melanocytes are uh, actually arise from the neural crest from the neural crest they actually migrate into the epidermis these melanocytes will actually produce a hormone called as or uh, called as tyrosine which is responsible for melanin production when we are talking about the origin of this melanoblast we have two theories one is epidermal theory and we have a neurogenic theory which will talk about the origin of the melanoblast coming to the hormones that are con controlling this melanin production we have melanocyte stimulating hormone that is the reason acth and sex hormones that is the reason uh, you know uh, we have this malignant melanoma uh, there is a controversy that especially during the pregnancy or increased estrogen they have they actually uh, link this to malignant melanoma and definitely malignant melanoma will get worsen in case when the patient is uh, you know pregnant or pregnant this we can see the prognosis of malignant melanoma is usually uh, you know very poor in those cases now these melanomas all the melanomas arise from melanoblast at dermal epidermal junction remember at the dermal epidermal junction we see all the melanoblasts are present which actually travel up and at the upper layer we see them as melanocytes malignant melanoma usually occur at the basal layer you know at the junction of dermo epiderm the epidermodermal junction in uh, melanoblast we can see this kind of uh, condition okay next is about the origin of it we see they either can become from de novo or most commonly they are exist from a pre existing lesion okay from a pre existing lesion such as nevus most commonly a nevus or a mole from there we can see this uh, melanoma is usually coming this nevus can be a simple nevus it can be a junctional nevus it can be an epidermal uh, compound nevus or it can be a, 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 a lentigo maligna or hutchinson's uh, lentigo also from these we can see this benign melanomas now usually melanomas are nothing but hematomas of melanocytes and uh, melanomas are known to occur because of excessive stimulation of the melanocytes to produce melanin so this stimulation usually comes from the ex its exposure to uh, sunlight or uv radiation where they actually uh, tend to produce more amount of melanin this might or uh, more amount of uh, proliferation of your melanoblast or melanocytes which can result in malignant melanoma coming to etiology it is it you it can occur at any age usually uh, however uh, it is not more common in puberty age you know in, in age younger than puberty or moreover it is seen in elderly age group women are more uh, you know uh, commonly involved if women are involved prognosis is better when compared to that of men have more malignant melanoma is usually occurring in the lower extremities in the lower extremities it is usually occurring and um, in whites it is more common uh, especially those who are exposed to more amount of sunlight because uh, of that actinic value actinic value of the sunlight more amount of uh, exposure to sunlight 
there are uh, you know whites are most commonly involved more uh, exposure to uv light also especially severe sunburns lentigo maligna is a condition where we can see if patient is uh, you know uh, exposed to severe sunburn in those conditions we can see this uh, malignant melanomas and uh, sites palms most common sole most common external genitalia is most common in whites we can see sub angual melanomas we can see meninges and choroid of eye also can be involved in case of your malignant melanomas and uh, as i told stimulation right if there is a trauma continuous trauma to the nevus even then we can uh, see transformation of this nevus into melanomas and uh, as i said hormonal relation or relation of pregnancy to uh, melanomas is still controversial however it is also linked you know the steroid hormones and uh, pregnancy is also been linked to that of production of uh, melanin or melanoma now coming to classification variants of our uh, melanomas or especially the benign melanomas we are classified into hairy mole or non hairy and smooth mole as the name itself indicates hairy mole is actually a flat or raised uh but or you know a discoloration macule kind of it with hair to it that's the reason it is called as hairy mole and usually it is uh, commonly seen in with infected sebaceous glands and we can see swelling sometimes tenderness in these cases uh, non hairy or smooth mole is again a flat or raised one uh, it is a smooth or warty however it does not have any hair into it next we have blue nevus why blue nevus because mm, the nevus is actually uh, present deep into the tissue because of present in the deep into the tissue uh, and because of the uh, light uh, refraction and refraction phenomena it usually appears blue in color it is also called as mongolian spot usually most commonly seen in children and to see also it is usually smooth and shiny next we have junctional nevus junctional nevus is one which is has to be taken uh, you know it has to give, has to be given more care because it has high malignant potential okay it can turn into malignant melanoma this benign kind of uh, nevus it is usually smooth or elevated and we can see in different shades we can see it in black color brown color or light bluish or reddish mark also is a junctional nevus next is compound nevus in compound nevus again we can uh, have them as uh, epiderm intradermal or junctional one usually the junctional compound again component is again has more potentially malignant and juvenile melanoma usually as the name itself indicates in children it is a juvenile mole it is usually benign and not malignant next one is hutchinson's freckle also called as lentigo maligna is hutchinson's freckle usually it is uh, and macular or tumor stage you can just see it as a flat patch or a, a tumefactive growth can be seen in this case of freckle you can be warty or it can be smooth also this hutchinson's freckle has a high malignant potential uh, it can turn into lentigo maligna melanoma however it develops late it is a slow growing one and it takes time it is a late development whenever we see this hutchinson's freckle always excise for you know uh, to prevent any malignant uh, transformation in it so this is about benign melanomatic conditions now we'll go into malignant melanoma malignant melanoma is nothing but your malignant lesion of melanoblast and uh, as we have discussed <clears throat> commonest sites can be again your skin palm uh, soles okay etc and origin of this malignant melanoma is again uh, in the you know at the basal layer of melanoblast okay and uh, this can uh, uh, develop there and they can convert into your mal uh, malignant melanoma here yeah, what happens is we can see all changes of dysplasia whenever we see malignant melanoma hypochromatism more amount of cy increased cytoplasm reverse polarity uh, nucleocytoplasmic ratio has been uh, reversed okay this all kinds of all changes of dysplasia can be seen along with this what we can see is vacuolated cytoplasm which will with fine uh, melanogranules will be seen in this cells okay fine melanogranules it actually resembles a paged cell paged cell is usually a large epithelial cell with more amount of cytoplasm and uh, and more uh, uh, cytoplasm and hyperchromatic nuclei similarly we see this paged uh, cell type and hence in malignant melanoma we have two types of uh, cellular features one is spindle cell uh, feature and one is pegetoid type okay in pegetoid type we have this maculated cytoplasm with uh, uh, melanogranules within it this what happens is now the vacuolated cells that are present there 
once they invade into the epidermis it means malignancy okay once a maculated cell invade the epidermis it indicates malignancy these tumor cells will invade sup, sub, uh, supra i mean the sub epidermal uh, zone of uh, the lymphatics this also will indicate malignancy okay once the maculated cells are involving your epidermal layer or they are involving your lymphatics it indicates a malignancy okay now coming to the etiology as we have discussed age uh, usually in older age group females more commonly involved blacks are commonly involved but whites uh, you know uh, can be involved especially when they are exposed to more amount of sunlight sun rays and uh, uh, a trauma of a nevus you know constant trauma to the nevus also can uh, change into your uh, malignant malignant melanoma now coming to histological classification we have four different types of histological uh, variants one is lentigo maligna melanoma superficial spreading melanoma we have acral lentigo melanoma and we have nodular melanoma when this talking about this melanoma one important thing as i told you the invasion into epidermis right invasion of the cells into epidermis we have pattern of growth here remember very important in case of this malignant melanoma we have two patterns of growth one is radial growth and one is vertical growth in this radial growth what happens is radial growth phase these cells usually spread horizontally in radial growth phase whereas in vertical growth phase these cells usually go down deep into the dermal structure from the epidermis it enters into the dermis so when this is happening what happens is, is this happens with nodular melanoma alone vertical growth phase remember is seen in nodular melanoma and highly uh, you know uh, severe form of malignancy in case of nodular melanoma when you're talking about lentigo maligno melanoma it is also called as hutchinson's freckle here usually seen in older age group people especially in 6th to 8th decade and in lentigo maligna melanoma as i told we have two different types of cellular patterns right spindle cell pattern is more predominantly seen we hardly see any pegetoid type of cells here usually seen in patients who are exposed to sun and we can see solar elastosis in histology you know in the slides we can see solar elastosis however this is of slow growing and the development is also very slow in case of your lentigo maligna melanoma and superficial spreading melanoma as the name itself indicates uh, it is seen on the superficial layers it can be seen both exposed and sun exposed and non exposed areas and you can see in thighs also okay superficial spreading melanoma one of the commonest type here we see hyperplastic uh, epidermis more predominantly we see pegetoid type of cells in superficial spreading melanoma and in superficial spreading melanoma as it spreads horizontally we can also see an outward growth of melanoma it can be need not be just smooth it can be bulging out it can be a warty type of growth next is acral lentigo melanoma usually seen in black uh, and palms soles and subungual regions if in white subungual regions is more common involved in case of this acral lentigo melanoma and in acral lentigo melanoma uh, no pegetoid cells at all remember acral lentigo melanoma will not have any pegetoid uh, type of cells and among these four types acral lentigo melanoma has more propensity to mucous membrane hence we can see them in the oral cavity in the vaginal region and also in the uh, you know other mucosal structures acral lentigo melanoma is usually seen this acral lentigo melanoma has poor prognosis again when compared to the other two superior the other two types of melanomas next is nodular melanoma remember the first three follow a radial phase of growth and uh, the third the last one that is nodular melanoma usually have this vertical growth phase okay nodular melanoma has vertical growth most malignant uh, uh, form of, of all this usually occurs in younger age group and it actually penetrates vertically downwards we see a uniform pigmentation with well circumscribed border in case of this nodular melanoma ulcerations are usually present we can see convex palpable lesion in case of your nodular melanoma now coming to staging of malignant melanoma stark uh, clark i'm sorry clark has given uh, a staging based upon the level of invasion he has divided them into five stages or five levels first level is uh, in situ level uh, is in situ level where we can see tumors usually present above the basement membrane in level 2 we can actually uh, uh, we have uh, two types of dermis layers papillary and reticular in level 2 what happens is extension will be into papillary but will not involve your reticular dermis 
In level 3, it can involve your interface between your papillary and reticular dermis. In fourth one, it will involve your reticular dermis. In level 5, the underlying subcutaneous fat can also be involved. So, based upon the depth of invasion, they are divided into five types. So, this is a picture which is actually showing uh, tumor in situ is usually present only in the epidermal layer. And uh, uh, T1, that is your level 1, is usually present within the papillary zone but not in your reticular zone. T2, at the junction of papillary and reticular. T3, involving your reticular. T4 or, or level 5, in, it is involving the underlying subcutaneous fat. Okay. Now, uh, when you are talking about prognosis, the best prognostic value is tumor thickness, not the tumor spread. Remember, it is a thickness. So, nodular carcinoma has worst prognosis when compared to all other four variants. Now, coming to spread, usually 90% of the lesion is by local invasion and we also see hematogenous spread and lymphatic spread in case of our malignant melanoma. And uh, when coming to the cardinal symptoms, size, uh, usually size uh, varies, you know, from smaller size, it grows into bigger in size. Color, it is a melanotic uh, color. Again, you have variant colors, usually blackish brown in color. But we can also see bluish color in case of your, uh, uh, huh, you know, blue nevus can also be seen. However, sometimes what happens, these melanoblast, uh, which are, you know, all melanomas are arising from melanoblast. However, some of them does not produce any melanin. It does not contain melanin at all. So those are called as amelanotic melanoma. And this is really, really confusing one. In a melanotic melanoma, because we cannot diagnose it properly because of absence of all the particular features of it that is does not have any color etc. Then uh, a melanotic melanoma is usually, uh, you know, which will miss the diagnosis and can be potentially fatal again. And sometimes we can see slight bleeding, local spread is usually present. Lymph node involvement, uh, usually lymph nodes are uh, not involved in case of malignant melanoma. However, sometimes you know we can see involvement of lymph nodes also. Usually not painful, sometimes it can be itching. In late stages, because of all our malignant features, again constitutional symptoms like weight loss, we can see dyspnea and jaundice can also be seen in case of your malignant melanoma. So how do you examine? Local examination by its site based upon different sites that are present, even in sun exposed and non-exposed sun exposed areas. Color, uh, and you will not even you will not have much of temperature change there, tenderness slightly. Uh, usually they are painless but you can see the itching or uh, you can feel the itchiness and surface and surrounding skin some usually smooth but sometimes they can be warty in growth and uh, uh, surrounding skin can be usually normal except for the infiltration and the consistency is usually soft uh, except for your nodular melanoma which can be slightly firm in consistency. Uh, uh, lymph nodes and mobility are usually not uh, involved and organ involvement can be seen in general examination uh, and in can, when you are talking about non-cutaneous melanomas, in non-cutaneous melanomas it, it means that it involves mucous membranes, so oral cavity is involved, uh, in viscera such as your lungs and uh, you know internal organs can also be involved in case of non-cutaneous melanoma, ocular melanoma, ocular melanoma can also be involved, meningeal or dural melanoma and we can also see choroid of the eye can also be involved in case of your non-cutaneous melanomas. And clinical staging, based on clinical staging, we have, they have, we have three different stages. Stage 1 is only a primary tumor. Stage 2, we have satellite tumors along with the primaries and sometimes we can see our enlarged lymph nodes. And in stage 3, we can see distant metastasis. We can see metastasis to viscera and we can also see uh, metastasis to lymph nodes. Now, coming to special investigations that we actually do, perform excisional biopsy, uh, we can, where we can see uh, melanocytes, predominant sites we can see and we can also see uh, our pegetoid types of cells which are you know, more predominantly seen there again. Set, CT and PET will actually give us, uh, you know, in PET we can see uh, the melanoma hotspot, you know, the uh, melanoma um, malignant uh, condition that has been taking place over there. Ultrasonography, endoscopy to see for esophageal metastasis. We can, in endoscopy, we can see nice that, uh, you know, visceral involvement, you no know, malignant melanoma involving viscera, where we can see that blackish discolorations in, uh, in, in, within, the, within the endoscopy. Bone scan, if there is any bone metastasis, then we can see uh, through bone scan or even PET, uh, we can, you know, we can see a red uh, or hot spot can be seen. 
in those cases in mri will help us in you know checking for any cns metastasis now coming to management there are two types of management one is local and systemic management in local management first thing is surgery excisional biopsy with the clearance margin is very important 2 cm clearance margin to prevent any recurrence in some cases we can go ahead with split skin graft if digits are involved amputate and elective node resection has to be done when lymph nodes are involved in case of your malignant melanoma in malignant melanoma usually lymph nodes are involved okay and in systemic management systemic chemotherapy especially with the carbazin can be given immunotherapy is also uh, advocated nowadays especially interleukin 2 is useful in case of this immunotherapy remember malignant melanomas are radio resistant and resistant and hence radiotherapy is usually not indicated now coming to next type of tumor that is sarcoma sarcoma is again a uh, soft tissue tumor rare tumor only 1% of all tumors uh, comes into sarcoma sarcoma is not this soft tissue it can also involve heart tissue for example bone osteosarcoma uh, it is occurs usually in younger age group in second and third uh, decades of life and metastasis is usually blood borne or hematogenous root and sarcoma as we discussed are of two types one is soft tissue sarcoma and osteosarcoma involving the bone when we are actually dividing this or when we are you know uh, checking for carcinoma and sarcoma the differences between them is carcinoma is usually occurring in middle and old age when the sarcomas occur in younger age group this carcinomas occur in groups and sarcomas are diffuse sheet and uh, carcinoma we see the stroma which is well formed there whereas in sarcoma the stroma is not usually well formed it is poorly formed in carcinoma hemorrhage and necrosis is usually less we see hemorrhage even in carcinomas but when compared to sarcoma it is less in sarcoma we can see very huge hemorrhage okay we can see more amount of hemorrhage when compared to your carcinomas carcinoma is usually slow growing sarcomas are very fast growing they are rapidly growing and they can you know occur uh, even patient can die if is not treated in just two months span of time okay so sarcomas are usually rapidly growing and the spread of carcinoma lymphatic spread whereas sar predominantly okay they can spread through other routes also the sarcoma predominantly spreads through hematogenous route hematogenous route because they are very vicinity to your blood vessels okay and uh, highly radio uh, sensitive carcinomas whereas sarcomas are radio resistant and uh, coming to sarcomas we are as we said we have two types soft tissue and uh, hard tissue in soft tissue sarcomas it can occur at any site not encapsulated sometimes it can have a pseudo capsule and uh, we can see local invasion uh, along the facial spaces that is along the line of least resistant uh, these sarcomas has very high local recurrence and they can metastasize to very distant organs when we are talking about osteosarcoma in sarcomas osteosarcoma is usually more common even osteosarcomas of jaw can also occur Uh, radiographically this osteosarcomas have a uh, you know sobable appearance nice sobable appearance can be seen in case of this uh, osteosarcomas okay and uh, uh, coming to fibrosarcoma it is again a variant of sarcoma where we can see it is nothing but a malignant counterpart of part of your fibroma here cells show pleomorphism with mitotic activity uh, whereas uh, you know uh, fibroma is actually a malignant counterpart of your uh, Uh, you know fibroma fibrosarcoma is a malignant counterpart of your fibroma here usually cells show pleomorphism and uh, they have a high mitotic activity the we see very scanty collagen formation in case of fibrosarcoma dilated veins are present over the tumor okay we have warm and pulsatile type of uh, uh, appearance on palpation in case of this fibrosarcoma diagnosis biopsy incisional biopsy if the lesion is small if it is uh, uh, if the lesion is large and if the lesion is small we can go for uh, you know complete excision chest films are useful and ct and angiography especially for blood vessels can be done in case of your sarcomas management as i already told they are usually radio resistant surgery is more accepted therapy treatment wide local excision has to be done in case of surgery excision of any muscle group which has been involved has also to be done to prevent recurrence and in uh, if it is involving any digits or limbs lower limbs amputation is usually uh, advocated radiotherapy as i told it is uh, relatively radio resistant but 
osteosarcoma other than your soft tissue sarcomas hard tissue sarcomas are usually sensitive to radiotherapy next one is chemotherapy which is you know more helpful in case of sarcomas combination has to be given where a radiotherapy with chemotherapy or surgery with chemotherapy or all the uh, concurrent chemo radiotherapy these combinations will actually help in case of this sarcomas usually in embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma chemotherapy works wonders and a regimen like VAC regimen where vincristine, actinomycin D, cyclophosphamide can has to be given for one to two years will actually work wonders for case of sarcomas. Next type of tumor is usually desmoid tumor. This desmoid tumor is uh, usually occurs in the anterior abdominal wall uh, and it uh, occurs from muscle aponeurosis. These desmoid tumors are most commonly seen in uh, women uh, of a reproductive age group and these desmoid tumors can also you know develop or it can also occur within a surgical scar and uh, onset is usually near, near time of pregnancy that is the reason more commonly in reproductive age okay and these desmoid tumors are again of two types abdominal and extra abdominal abdominal as i already told you usually occurs in the anterior abdominal wall whereas the extra abdominal desmoids usually can occur on the shoulders and thighs when compared to this abdominal, extra abdominal desmoids are usually very very aggressive okay and desmoid tumors are very high in local recurrence and usually they do not metastasize and the management again is wide surgical excision if uh, it is the lesion is very large and uh, excision cannot be done you can take off some of the debulking of tissue can be done with radical radiotherapy would be of importance there again. Next one is synovial sarcoma. Synovial sarcoma is again a type of sarcoma usually occurs in vicinity to the joints. However, it does not completely involve the synovial membrane. Okay, usually seen in young adults and uh, uh, hands and feet are most common locations. It, the, le the lesion is usually soft, painless, sarcomatous swelling. We can see metastasis to the lymph nodes in case of synovial sarcoma. And uh, treatment for synovial sarcoma is again excision. Next is Kaposi's sarcoma. Kaposi's sarcoma is nothing but a malignant tumor of blood vessels. Usually the common location is skin and most commonly seen in case of males. Kaposi's sarcoma is one of the eight defining conditions and usually or very much commonly seen in case of HIV infected patients. Okay, It is one of the eight defining conditions. When you're talking about Kaposi sarcoma, usually the lesion is purplish red in color, involves soft tissue. Most common site in oral mucosa is in the palatal region. It can also occur in the gingiva and this Kaposi sarcoma or alveolar mucosa. Okay, Kaposi sarcoma is again soft in consistency where we can see friable gingiva and gingival uh, expansion can be seen. Uh, usually the treatment for Kaposi sarcoma is irradiation okay radiotherapy will help will be helpful in treating this Kaposi's sarcoma so these are about various type of malignant tumors of the skin we have uh, seen in detail hope this give you gave you and uh, you know uh, you know brief uh, uh, introduction or brief enlightenment into your various types of malignant tumors of the skin thank you